Welcome and thank you for participating in today's Department of Energy Solar Decathlon virtual session, which will address zero energy ready homes, new and growing fast. My name is Jonathan Cohen and I work on the Solar Decathlon as well as run the Better Buildings Residential Network with your Department of Energy. We strongly encourage you to ask the questions you want answers to on today's virtual session. That is why we are here. And we are very happy to have with us uh, two uh, stellar speakers from the Department of Energy today. And before we go to them, we want to share that there will be a, uh, a recording of this virtual session that will be available on the Solar Decathlon website. Just search Solar Decathlon and solardecathlon.gov and you will uh, reach the website and be able to access all of those recordings. And also you will find our social media, including uh, our YouTube channel uh, for the recordings. So uh, with that, uh, we're gonna move on to our next slide and just share with you uh, that you are in for a, uh, uh, a very informative and interesting session today. We're gonna briefly mention what other upcoming virtual sessions you can look forward to, as well as how to ask a question on this virtual session, then we'll get to our presentations. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. And we are very happy to share that this series, which started in September and runs through the culmination of the actual solar decathlon competitions, uh, uh, a crowning of, of winners, has two more sessions left. Next will be Wednesday, March 17th, shining a light on solar, a tour of cutting edge solar research with the US Department of Energy, and that will feature the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar uh, Energy Technology Office and the work that, that they are doing. And then we will culminate on Friday, uh, excuse me, actually that will be Wednesday, April 26th. We've changed that date for the Solar Decathlon Build Challenge winning team house tours. So there are numerous different uh, categories of winners, and we will feature a selection of those so you can see what went into winning that international competition of collegiate teams from, uh, from far and wide uh, and, and for different house type categories and different building categories as well. So next slide, please. So to ask a question on today's virtual session, please pay attention to the red boxes to be able to, in the upper left, either virtually raise your hand and grab uh, our attention in order to unmute you since everybody is muted at the moment or in the red box in the lower middle of your screen you can chat your question and we will see that question and look at those to pull out questions to ask for our speakers as well and so uh, we will refer to those as we move ahead and that is something that we really encourage people to do again the idea is not to just have a presentation but to also have a discussion and we'll leave ample time at the end of the uh, virtual session for your questions. So with that, we're gonna move on to our next slide, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce two, uh, two colleagues here at the Department of Energy. Sam Raskin is the Chief Architect of the Building Technologies Office in the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. He's also the author of the book titled Retooling the U.S. Housing Industry, How It Got Here, Why It's Broken, and How to Fix It. That presents a comprehensive strategy for transforming the new home buyer consumer experience. Sam brings the lessons from this book to housing executives across the country with workshops and collaborative meetings that help them accelerate innovation. And apart from this work, Sam has earned a national reputation for his work leading housing programs that have partnered with thousands of home builders and resulted in over 1 million certified high performance homes. Sam was recently recognized uh, uh, in uh, numerous ways in the department uh, and he also uh, has been recognized for his contributions to sustainable housing with the 2012 Hanley Award. I'm also pleased to introduce my colleague, Terrence Mosley, who is an AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the Department of Energy. He is an engineering professional with 18 years in progressively increased responsibility in various roles in automotive, uh, automotive excuse me, engineering. Uh, most notably, he was... Uh, for 10 years, a regional quality manager for the southeastern U.S. region for Delphi Automotive. And for 10 years, he served as an entrepreneur as the president of Orleans Holdings Consulting and Development located in Jackson, Mississippi. So uh, 
and he has many more accomplishments that uh, would take uh, a lot more time to go through. And suffice to say that we have two very accomplished speakers with us today, and it gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over to them. Sam and Terrence, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's, it's just great to be here today, and I know we get quite a diverse crowd. Uh, but this session is really important to us because we're ready to go to the next generation of zeros. I've kind of taken the liberty to kind of modify the title of this session. The Solar Decathlon Design Competition has, from the beginning, required that all entries are built at least the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home program specifications, and the students often do a great job going way beyond. But now Zero Energy Ready Home is ready to move to the next step. Version two is coming out in 2022 and we're in full development to get it ready. And in effect, we've kind of created a vision for what is the next generation of zero? What will it look like? And today we're just couldn't be happier to present, present, present it to you. And I couldn't be happier than to do it with my uh, famous colleague, Terrence Mosley. Uh, we'll switch along the ways, but you'll have the two of us to kind of walk you through. Terrence, why don't you start off? Hey, thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, and and it is a pleasure to speak to you all today. And one of the reasons is that when we're when we're looking at moving to the next generation of the zero energy ready homes program, the timing couldn't be better. When you look at the new administration's plan to build a modern, sustainable infrastructure and an equitable equitable clean energy future, one of their goals is to achieve net zero emissions economy-wide by no later than 2050. So when you break this down and really look at it from a building's perspective, what is our big goal? When we connect into the goal of the administration and what we're trying to do over these next few years, what we need to be doing is reduce the carbon footprint of the U.S. building stock by 80% by 2035, which is not that far away, and also by 100% by 2050. But while we're doing that, we have to still maintain or improve affordability, comfort, and performance. So when you, when you look at this big goal, there's no, there's no way that we can do it without zero carbon buildings. When you look at some stats that are that are well known today, uh, buildings, the building share of total U.S. energy use is at 40%. And when you look at the building share of total U.S. electricity use, it's up to 74%. That was at 70% uh, over the last couple of years, and it's actually gone up. So buildings use a lot of electricity, as you can see. The fossil, fa fossil fuel share of the total uh, U.S. electricity is 63%. But when you look at the U.S. as a as a share of the global population, we're only 4% of the global population. But when you look at our share of global CO2 emissions, we're at 14%, three and a half times our, 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 our share of the population. So what we're going to talk about today, though, is just in, to give you an overview of where we're going with the next uh, generation of the ZERO program. We're going to first talk about the path to zero, uh, looking at carbon options. Then we're going to show you some uh, updates to the baseline of the specs of the uh, Zero Energy Ready Home program. And then we're going to look at proven innovations that are under consideration for the next version of the program. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sam. Hey, thanks so much, Terrence. So the first step is um, try to demystify what zero energy buildings are all about because there's so many diverging and different uh, options out there and I think the best thing we could do before we start talking about next gen zero is really sort out what is the path really that all these programs lay out to get to this ultimate goal of zero carbon buildings and uh, before we do that it's really critical to understand the key factors that contribute uh, to a uh, zero carbon building, factors that we have to address as we keep making buildings better and better. So first thing we do is we try to create high performance buildings. And we achieve that with really good comprehensive building science, 
we address the indoor air quality of the buildings, water conservation becomes a bigger and bigger concern as that resource gets more and more constrained. Uh, buildings have to be better interacting with the grid, so grid interactive buildings are important. And of course, we all today, as many people, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of households are without power in the Midwest, we understand the importance of resilience and it has to be integrated into a high performance building. So we have all these factors we're trying to address for performance. And of course, it has to be an energy efficient building. So we care about getting the annual energy consumption as low as we can. And there's a path where we do it with uh, electricity and fossil fuel. And therefore we have uh, carbon emitted on site or we can go all electric without fossil fuel and create more pathways to be uh, having no carbon footprint as we only use renewable energy. So we have those two options as we seek energy efficient performance. And then to get offsets for the remaining energy we use, we look at renewable energy. And there are various options for that. We can have on-site renewables, we can have local microgrids providing renewable energy. We can in fact uh, work with a local utility to only purchase renewable energy and we can purchase offsets to basically account for all of our on-site energy uh, carbon consumption. So, so renewables are really important to kind of offset the op operational energy. But that leaves us with all the embodied energy encumbered in the materials we use. And uh, for those materials to be applied to buildings, we have to extract resources. We have to put them through a production process. We have to transport them to uh, distribution centers and then to building sites. We have to install the materials, maintain them, and end the life we have to dispose, recycle, reuse, whatever we do with the materials. So we have all this embodied carbon effectively that's with the materials, and then we have the operational carbon that we think about. So let's understand this path to uh, zero carbon with those four factors. And so uh, first, the pathway. We have code minimum homes, which are getting better and better. The, the energy codes have gotten so much stronger over time, 50% since 2009 to 2021 IECC. So the codes are doing a great job cr creating a higher and higher baseline for high performance homes. But then truly high performance where you add additional requirements uh, for building science and a real comprehensive approach to the uh, mechanical systems, that's how we get to a high performance home. It's above code and additional rigor for all the building science and comfort features in our homes. Then zero energy ready takes us to the next step where we're even more efficient and we're ready to offset all of our operational carbon. And then zero net energy is when we actually use renewables to offset it. And zero net carbon is when we have no onsite carbon uh, footprint because we're all electric and net positive carbons when we start generating more renewable energy than we consume to have a reservoir of carbon to offset the embodied energy. So that's how we start to address the embodied energy as well. So this is the pathway. I'm gonna show you how it works from step to step with the four factors we discussed. High performance, which we talked about all the features of that, annual energy consumption as a reflection of the energy efficient performance of the building. And the light green is with fossil fuel, the dark green is without fossil fuel. And then there's renewable energy's contribution in yellow. And then embodied energy and at last, how that represents a more and more significant component of the total carbon in our buildings. So if we start with a code minimum building, it's gotten uh, very efficient over time. And I use this green bar to represent the energy efficiency level of a code minimum home. The high performance is built into the code, and then there's a degree with which it's enforced. So we, it gets complicated, but we have, we have a good level of high performance in the code as well. Codes don't normally require renewable, so you see no yellow bar here. And then we have the embodied energy, which is a fraction of the, uh, of the energy consumption carbon for the building. So the operational carbon is much greater than the embodied. When we go above code to high performance homes, now the performance gets ratcheted up even further with even more building science and comfort features. So it's higher than this bar. 
the energy efficiency is above code, so it's lower than the code minimum, still no renewable, and then the embodied carbon's the same, but now you notice it's getting to be a more significant percent of the actual operational carbon. So you see the path we're kind of taking here. So zero energy ready home even gets more high performance features and has therefore a higher bar for the gray bar. It gets even more energy efficient. So maybe another 20% more than a high performance home. So the energy use is lower, but it could still be with fossil fuel, no renewables. And we have embodied carbon now more than the operational carbon of the building. So it's getting more and more significant. When we go zero net energy, the only thing that changes is the renewable energy is added to offset the uh, electric consumption in the building. So we zero out the electric and we still have the embodied carbon. Again, greater now, much greater because we offset the on-site electricity. So zero net carbon, we go to a dark green, all electric building, and that can ostensibly get all renewable power or purchase renewable power. And then we have whatever we have offset uh, with renewable energy. And we have the same relationship now where again, the embodied energy is still a, a very significant part, even the most significant part of the carbon footprint of the building. So our path to zero carbon ends with net positive carbon where we even ramp up the renewable contribution so it can start contributing to offsetting the embodied carbon and getting us on a pathway to zero carbon buildings. So when you hear about all the different programs and you hear a lot of different resources and, and labeling options are out there, they will be in one of these buckets, one of these five buckets. Uh, and to show you where the most common ones are, Energy Star Certified Homes, uh, version three is the latest, is a high performance program. It's above code, it builds up the building science, it takes down the energy efficient below code. And so it's a really great foundational program. And you've been in the solar decathlon program, you've been doing zero energy ready. And so you've been doing this level with version one. You've been basically uh, reducing the energy even further than Energy Star and adding more performance and doing a great job with that. Now, many of you in the past have added renewable energy and gone past version one. And we see the same thing with a lot of the builders in the zero energy ready home program. So version two realizes there's a significant opportunity to recognize both steps of this path to zero carbon staircase, if you will. So we'll have a zero ready label that builds even further on the first label and a zero energy label for those buildings that address the on-site electricity and replace it with renewable energy. So that's the, uh, the kind of the completion of how this whole staircase works and how Zero Energy Ready Home program is expanding to address the next two steps of the staircase. I'll mention that DOE and EPA are in discussions about how they can join forces to think about options to do zero net carbon buildings as well. So a lot of interesting future uh, uh, labeling options to look for when we get to zero net carbon. So laying it out as quickly or as, as, as uh, clearly as we can, we had Zero Energy Ready Home version one, we're gonna to move to zero energy home version two under a new name, the zero home program, because it will have two options. You could do a zero ready home or a zero energy home. So that's what you can expect from the zero energy ready home program. And what we wanna do is talk about many of the different uh, upgrades that you are, uh, that we are considering for this next label before we put it out for public comment and give you a very good sense in the solar decathlon program of where you probably should be to be a really competitive building. So we're gonna talk about first the update to the baseline and then we'll talk about other innovations that we're considering. So the way this is easiest to kind of uh, convey to you is there are four main programs out there. There's the IACC in all of its various forms. I show here 2012 as a option that is at least more than half the states, that are 2009. And then you have Energy Star version three in its various forms, three and 3.1. And then you have zero energy ready home. So if you were looking at the HERS index by comparison, 
ICC would be about 70 to 80. Energy Star version 3, 65 to 75. 3.1 gets a little bit bumped down to 55 to 65. And Zero Energy Ready Home, the HERS index is 48 to 55. And then your enclosure will be tied to a, uh, with each of these programs, one of the uh, IECC codes. So obviously, 2012 IECC is the 2012 IECC. Energy stars take the 2009, and you can see why version 3.1 came along to get it at least up to 2012. And Zero Energy Ready Home is pegged to 2015, which is why we're doing version 2, because it's time to raise the baseline above the 2015 now that the IECC 2021 code is published. Now, all these programs that are, are these labeling programs use independent verification with the ResNet uh, HERS rating system. Um, I know EPA is considering some other uh, opportunities for other over, uh, verification oversight groups to step up. Right now, HERS verification is a common feature of all the programs. All the programs have rigorous water management, which means keeping bulk moisture out of the buildings because the enclosures are so much better insulated and air sealed. We know that they have a higher wetting potential and a lower drying potential. Just insulation and air sealing is doing its job. So we just do the prudent requirements of keeping bulk water out of the enclosure. It's just a mandatory must have. And then the comfort systems are much improved with all these programs. We have HVAC with quality installation, oversight, and whole house ventilation is required. And Zero Energy Ready Home then goes further above Energy Star with optimized duct location, most commonly inside the condition space. And then we have indoor air quality with the EPA Indoor Air Plus program. We have efficient components and hot water uh, features in the home and solar-ready construction. So that's the program, and these are effectively the upgrades to go from Energy Star to Zero Ready. The HERS score, a higher baseline enclosure, a better uh, or more rigorous duct location requirement, indoor air quality, efficient components, and solar-ready. And so let's start with the enclosure of the home. And the very first thing that's uh, lined up that's probably a sure bet for version two going to the 2021 IECC. And this is very significant because the 2021 IECC is such an outstanding code. It very much reflects a uh, zero energy ready enclosure in the way it's constructed. And you can, I've combined all the key requirements, prescriptive requirements, just to give you a sense of just how uh, excellent a code the next forthcoming IECC is. Uh, you can see the ceilings are, are 49 to 60, roughly. Uh, the hyphen number that you see, or the slash number, is the reduced requirement if you have a raised heel truss. And in all zero energy ready homes, uh, the raised heel truss is mandatory. So effectively, if you're doing prescriptive, you actually could do the second number in the zero energy ready home program. You also see that the uh, program is also increasing uh, the wall requirements, particularly in zones, well, in zones four and five, climate zones four and five, you're required effectively to do a thermal bridging solution with either uh, R5 or R10 ridge insulation on top of the R20 or R13 cavity insulation. Uh, the uh, uh, climate zone six and seven stay pretty much like the uh, 2015 requirements and uh, zones one, two, and three are pretty much the same as they've been in the past. These yellow boxes are where 2021 bumps things up from the prior IECC codes. Uh, floor insulation has, stays pretty much the same. Basement insulation stays pretty much the same. But most significantly, climate zones three through five now, as I think is very prudent, require slab edge insulation. Uh, that had been out of the IECC up to 2021. And it's a very substantial uh, form of heat loss or heat gain in slab on grade buildings, even in climate zones three through five. So you get a sense basically of where the baseline is going. It's going to be a very substantial enclosure. 2021, again, takes you to an outstanding baseline for the program. And uh, you see the window oh, 
Uh, I wanted to mention one more thing. I forgot to on this slide. Uh, what we are considering in locations that allow no uh, thermal bridging, climate zones one through three, we are considering uh, with version two to require always some form of thermal bridging. And then you see the window requirements are basically about moving to a R3 window throughout the country. And what DOE is considering is moving to a minimum R4 in climate zone six through eight, but very highly recommending R5 and R7 windows in the colder climate. So R5 at least in climate zone five and R7 in six and eight. But we're pretty confident that we want to move at least to an R4 window to start moving the bar. This will be better than an energy star window and start getting the market acclimated to just better windows and cold climates. Really important we go there. If you want a comparison of the 2021 IECC stringency compared to the current zero energy ready home requirements, um, you see roughly the warmer climates, climate zones one and two, it's a modest increase uh, of 5%, as you would expect, because the enclosure has a much less impactful outcome on energy use in hot climates. So the enclosure is less important, the increase is less significant. Uh, what winds up happening, interestingly, is the middle part of the country, you get a big boost in the stringent requirements with 2021. And the biggest reason for that is I mentioned the slab edge insulation is a huge contributor to making that those climate zones perform much better. It was kind of a loophole, to be fair, in uh, energy performance in those uh, climate zones up to now, not requiring slab edge insulation. And the cold, cold climates also get a modest, modest boot, boost in performance. The very cold climate zone six and seven really had a good baseline, even with the 2015 and 2018 IACC. So this is effectively kind of fixing the little gap in the, um, in the moderate climates, and it's a much better baseline. And now we're going to go to proven innovations that we're also thinking about. And so the best way to talk about those is to highlight the innovations that we're considering pegged to the kind of framework of our program. And what we do with zero energy ready home, and I think most good zero energy programs, is step one is you first make sure you've optimized energy efficient performance. And you do that with a really good enclosure. And then after the enclosure, you go inside the home and make the equipment, appliances, and lighting more efficient. Now that you've optimized efficiency, what you want to do is optimize protection. We mentioned that the really high performance enclosures really need to keep water out, so you optimize water protection. Also, the comfort in these homes is kind of a different trick when you have such low load, so we have all sorts of requirements to ensure comfort in low load homes. And then the very tight construction, we make sure we have comprehensive indoor air quality, really optimize protection in the critical areas. And we want these homes to be future ready. So costs for solar keep dropping, let's make the homes uh, able to install solar in the future with no disruption or cost penalty, solar ready. Let's meet and exceed future codes so homes will withstand the test of time. And we have a nice resilient dividend because these homes are more comfortable longer following a power failure. Let's also look at other opportunities possibly to think about how we can enhance resilience. And so that earns our label. And what we're going to do is move to a zero home program will bump up the enclosure, the equipment, the appliances. We're going to bump up indoor air quality, tracking what the EPA Indoor Air Plus program does. I think we're pretty solid with the water protection and comfort there. And then we're going to bump up solar readiness, particularly in terms of coverage. And we're going to move to the 2021 IECC, which we've already covered. And we're looking at resilience and opportunities to even integrate that, particularly as we've seen uh, some really significant challenges with uh, climate increasing the intensity and frequency of the number of climate events. So that's the framework and that's what's driving the innovations that we're looking to for the next gen zero home. Uh, the coverage will uh, be uh, primarily focused on single family detached and single family attached homes for this discussion. Uh, what a zero energy, zero energy ready home plans to do for multifamily is to track what EPA Energy Star is doing 
with Energy Star Multifamily uh, Construction, just one program for all multifamily, and we plan just to track with that and work off that program. So the program innovations under consideration I'd like to kind of work through you today with uh, Terrence is we're uh, expanding the dehumidification zone is a consideration because we know that um, uh, these homes have much longer, um, have much shorter um, uh, cooling seasons because of the better enclosure and therefore the, uh, the, the swing seasons when you have no air conditioning are much longer. So we have to think about being more attentive to uh, avoiding de uh, uh, humidification challenges in these homes. And also these homes have such short cycling because they need such small cooling uh, um, from the uh, compressor cooling. We want to make sure that also we're managing dehumidification even during the regular cooling season. We want to therefore require whole house dehumidification and hot humid climates. We want to, we mentioned, move to higher R value windows and cold climates. We want to eliminate thermal bridging in almost all climates. And also we want to move to high capture kitchen exhaust as that technology be, becomes more market ready. So uh, here we are, and we're going to talk about the EPA indoor air package first as, we're, uh, as some of the likely changes ahead as we look to track the EPA indoor air plus program. And their proposed updates are uh, more zones will be considered for radon resistant construction, uh, more uh, requirements for low chemical materials, in particular, I think drywall is one material under consideration for additional requirements. Uh, they are possibly going to track what we've done with optimizing the location of heating and cooling ducts and put it within their specifications. Um, they're also going to upgrade the uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, what, first in terms of requiring balanced ventilation uh, in all climate zones, and ramping up the filtration from MERV-8 to MERV-13. Um, they're also looking at requirements for drilling unit uh, uh, exhaust for kitchen and bathrooms. Again, more efficient exhaust systems and better uh, spot ventilation effectively. Uh, also that the ducted forced air system filtration, again, has that MERC 13 filter. Uh, humidity control will be uh, ramped up, uh, again, because of the higher challenges with dehumidification that are addressed in better, enclosed, better enclosure homes. Um, more requirements for combustion appliance uh, choices, and also dwelling unit air sealing, particularly in multifamily units. So just a few of the considerations in more detail. Currently, radon resistant construction is limited to zone one. The thoughts by EPA Indoor Air Plus are to move it to uh, zone two. And in zone three, that uh, you have uh, the option to go with radon resistant construction or provide occupants with content so they understand the risk. So this is under consideration uh, by Air Plus. They're also thinking of moving to optimize duct location, much like we are. So that would either be the ducts inside the condition space or within the thermal boundary, which can be buried in the attic insulation. So you have at least um, adequate coverage uh, to avoid condensation on the ducts in uh, humid conditions, but pretty much tracking what we've been doing. So that won't be new either way. Either it will be in the Air Plus requirements or in the uh, zero energy ready home specifications. Uh, again, I mentioned that the uh, mechanical ventilation is likely to move to balance requirements for all locations, um, uh, but the, it won't require that there is heat exchange. So you don't have to do uh, enthalpy recovery or heat recovery. You could do a low cost, more simple exhaust and supply combination with controls it's only required to be balanced under the current uh, specification draft that's being routed. And uh, the other requirements for they have is, I mentioned the MERV-13 filtration. Um, and they're also thinking about moving to the amount of ventilation to the ASHRAE 62.2 2013 or later, later, which will ramp up the uh, specified amount of flow 
about 30 or 40 percent. So this is a significant addition to the baseline CFM flow that would be required. So look out for how that plays out as well. And uh, with bathroom and kitchen exhaust ventilation, they're going to require that it complies with Energy Star, Energy Star certified homes uh, uh, or multifamily new construction. Uh, the biggest thing here would be the sun rating for the equipment uh, will be dropping down and, uh, uh, and special controls under consideration to make sure it operates uh, under conditions when cooking is happening or humidity is present in the bathrooms. Uh, again, the filtration going to R13 means that HVAC systems are going to need thicker racks for, uh, for uh, these better MERV, higher MERV uh, filtration uh, filters. And so uh, that's just going to move from, again, uh, one inch to a four or five inch rack will be common in HVAC systems. Uh, and they will maintain the prohibition on ozone generators. Uh, uh, and there'll be other requirements when you use electronic air cleaners. I don't want to go into too many details about the uh, Air Plus requirements, but you get a sense of just where the focus of the upgrades are for that program. Uh, for humidity control, uh, the big thing is having a monitor to flag when it becomes excessive, since there is a greater risk for that to happen. And uh, they will maintain the current requirements that in uh, zones one through four now, which is uh, increasing the boundary limits of the older specifications, so it can go all the way to zone four, you must have equipment installed to maintain the relative humidity uh, below 60%. And that can be done either with variable capacity equipment that can kind of throttle down and function like a dehumidifier, or you can have whole house dehumidification. So you have a choice how that's being done. The new uh, kind of feature here is the additional monitoring of humidity to make sure the systems are doing their job. And combustion Sam, appliances. You, you still have a number of slides left in only a couple of minutes. Just wanted to share. Thank you. Okay, the, I'll flip through the rest of these. You can read through the indoor plus specifications. Well, let me get on to, um, uh, to Terrence to talk about the additional requirements for uh, efficient components and hot water. Absolutely, um, and we'll we'll quickly run through this. But one of the areas where Sam talked about earlier that we're going to bump up requirements for the uh, version two is under uh, efficient components. So if you look at this slide, you can see that components and miscellaneous electrical loads are increasingly a larger part of the total energy uses. If you look at the energy use then, which basically represents very early on or pre-IECC 2006 type levels, you can see that energy use overall uh, in the heating and cooling was the main part of that. But as, as we've become more efficient with the envelope, you can look and see where energy use is now. And when you look at the reduction in heating and cooling, you can see the increase in lighting and appliances and our uh, um, uh, hot water and uh, water distribution. So if you go to the next slide, you can just see typical examples of where we are adding energy efficient appliances to our spec where if you you know, of course, you 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 can uh, utilize Energy Star appliances such as dishwashers and refrigerators. Uh, but where where we're trying to to look at this within the spec is that we're increasing our percentage of LED lighting. Um, uh, uh, LED lighting as part of our packages from 80 uh, up to uh, 90 95 percent. And then we're also looking at utilizing Energy Star uh, clothes dryers. And so just as just as a uh, just as a um as a note you can just look and see all of these different appliances and see how much you use them from day to day and and figure out that the more efficient that these appliances are the more they contribute to reducing that overall load and when you go to the next to the next uh, to, well it's actually the the last building block to the zero energy ready home program is the uh, is being solar ready and if you go to uh, look at this slide, you can see that basically rapidly falling prices have made solar more affordable than ever. So 
the average price uh, is shown on this chart uh, through the, uh, the latest numbers we had, had the, the average price of a completed PV system has dropped by 59% over the last decade. So as industry truly scales, the costs do decrease. If you look at this chart, you can see that what we're trying to get to the point of, you can see the the the, the yellow and the orange sections where solar ready is is required in our program versus the green part of the map, green portion of the map where uh, solar ready is encouraged. And what we're trying to do is lower that threshold uh, and basically in, in determining if a site should use um, uh, renewables uh, within our program, we're trying to lower that threshold to continue to expand solar throughout our program. Um, and if you if you also look at this uh, uh, at the at the next slide, you can see where our home energy uh, rating uh, scores, our her scores, are averaging within the 48 to 55 um, zone in, in the version one of the of the program. And with all of the changes that we've talked about and the bumping up of the uh, of the different specs, uh, if you move to the to this uh, next slide, you can see that basically this is by uh, climate zone, and you can see where that average comes from. We pretty much are averaging between the mid 40s to uh, to mid 50s, uh, with typical uh, zero energy uh, compliant HERS indexes by this climate zone. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see where we're looking at uh, at going. Um, last year, th and this number has been steadily growing uh, it, for 2019. Hey, oh yes. I just want to mention that the scores will probably drop somewhere around 44 to 54 yes. uh, from this front. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of time and looked over that. But but anyway, um, last year, well, well, let's go back to 2019. There was a total of 241,000 HERS ratings that were done with an average of 59 on the HERS index. Well, if you look at the latest numbers 20 in 2020, and this is even during a pandemic year, there were 297,000 plus HERS ratings performed across the country with an average score of 58. So if you look at where our averages fall, it equates out to approximately 100,000 homes that are ready for, that would qualify and are ready for the Zero Energy Ready Homes uh, program. So there's more and more homes that are, that are really uh, uh, getting closer to uh, high performance and, and to the highest performance with our program. So we're really encouraged about where some of these numbers are going. So anyway, if you go to the uh, next slide, I'll, I'll let Sam jump back in here to close this out, but it's just some updates to some of our zero energy ready home targets to uh, to continue to improve on this HERS score. Yeah, so it's running out of time, just essentially, you know, to, to be ready for next gen zero, we have to address obsolete specs. So we're raising the bar for certain equipment requirements. Uh, we're going to adjust um, some of the mandatory requirements you mentioned going to 2021 IECC and the additional requirements for energy star clothes, dryers and uh, lighting. Uh, and we, we want to also account for technology changes uh, air source heat pumps in very cold climates are becoming much more desirable. So we have to reflect, our specifications have to reflect opportunities to move into that space as well. And the HERS score basically, as you mentioned, will go from about 40 to about 44 to 54. And, uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, That's the key thing I think for you to know is that it's a steady movement down in terms of HERS scores. So uh, on top of that, the target HERS score for a zero energy ready home might be relaxed just to get air source heat pumps able to move into cold climates. And the HERS scores are uh, again going to drop roughly a few points. I mentioned 44 to 54. Last, last slide just to wrap up is res resiliency is on our mind. There's just so much um, uh, news every day confronting us with just how much risk the built environment faces, whether it's winds, flooding, wildfires, seismic hail, and we can add cold weather here as well. So 
we want to be respectful of uh, maybe how to bring forward opportunities to integrate this as well into our specifications. So that's the view to the future for zero energy ready home. Uh, we see uh, that our time, it couldn't be more ready and important to make a move to take the specs to the next level. And as you look at the solar decathlon in the future, this is hopefully informative for the types of innovations you should be considering in your designs. Uh, in the future, please reach out to Terrence if you have any questions, and I'll hand it back over to Jonathan uh, uh, for any questions you might have. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. And thank you also, Terrence, for that extremely informative and inspiring presentation. We really appreciate your, your expertise and your hard work on the subject. And now is the time where questions can be asked about their presentation while it is fresh in your mind. We're going to open the field for questions. And if you recall the earlier slide that showed how you can do that, you can click the virtual raise your hand function on the upper left, or you can chat in your question in the lower middle of, uh, of the box there that we showed. There you go. Perfect. And uh, so we want to encourage people to uh, send in their questions now. And we only have a few more minutes before we have to wrap things up before the top of the hour. So I'm going to turn things over to my colleague Tyler to see what questions have come in for Sam and Terrence. Tyler, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and we have a, a lot of questions from our audience, uh, and I certainly not enough time to get to them, but I will be sharing those with, uh, with both Sam and Terrence, and they can follow up. And do feel free to send your questions in as well. But jumping right in, um, Sam and Terrence, why does embodied energy not increase as you go from high performance to zero net carbon, uh, given that more intense technology is incorporated? It doesn't increase as uh, an amount of carbon because it reflects the materials used in the building. So those don't go up or down when you go to high performance. Uh, it could go up in terms of the amount of insulation if you're not using a low carbon insulation. Uh, but generally the products don't change and the carbon percent doesn't change. It's just, it's relative percent to the operational carbon keeps getting higher and higher as the operational carbon goes down and it stays pretty much fixed. If you want kind of the giveaway in terms of embodied carbon, the uh, secret sauce is that there are a few main culprits that are like an 80, 85% solution. It's concrete, it's steel, and there's some of the uh, insulation products like extruded polystyrene that have much higher concentrations of carbon. If you can address just concrete and steel, you have a huge opportunity to really uh, attack in a significant way the embodied carbon. There are precast concrete foundation solutions, for instance, that use 70% less carbon. And it's easy not to use any steel in residential construction or minimal amount of steel for fasteners. So uh, there are a lot of solutions for embodied carbon, but it doesn't really change much as you go from lower to higher performance. The only way it might be using more insulation, so some of the uh, foam insulation products, if they get added to a significant degree, might bump up actually the carbon in a uh, zero energy, energy building. So you if you're not conscious of your carbon uh, footprint in the materials you select, then there are impacts. Very good, thank you. A uh, question from Tom who says that the current power outage in Texas makes one reticent to rely on electric for heating, such as air source heat pumps. Um, the U.S. grid is uh, notorious for piecemeal management by private companies with little incentive to modernize it. How will that be addressed? Battery backup for heating would be very expensive. Great question. So um, there are two counteracting forces. As we move to zero energy buildings, the enclosure is getting so much more like a Yeti cooler, if you will, that the flow time before the building becomes un you know, where you can't occupy it and you risk freezing pipes and so forth takes days versus hours. So in an older home without zero energy performance, you might within six or eight hours start getting to where pipes might be over freeze and it's below 45 degrees inside. 
you know, you look at something like a passive house home, I think they go five or six days before they drop below 60, 55 degrees. They stay pretty much occupiable for a pretty extracted time frame. So you're buying resilience in terms of indoor, the ability to stay indoors reasonably comfortable. Uh, if you need to manage afterwards or if you have to have power, batteries do work less during cold weather, but they still work fine. And you have to realize how small the loads are in these buildings. Uh, your lighting, where it used to be hundreds and hundreds of watts, might be just 60, 70 watts of lighting. There's plenty of, plenty of lighting for your house. Your refrigerator maybe needs 50, 60 watts at most of power to keep the food from spoiling. Uh, to keep um, the uh, heat pump working, it's maybe the amount of power of a blow dryer for your hair. It's not a lot of power to keep a super high performance house operational. So I'd submit that you know a reasonable sized battery system could keep you going pretty well. And if you have any kind of solar resource uh, um, available subsequent to the event, whatever it may be that caused the disruption, and you have solar to charge the batteries, you can go on a pretty long time without any fossil fuels to keep the house as a backup. So there are a lot of solutions and it would probably suck up too much time to go through all the details, but you, you kind of get a sense of the trade-offs, but there's plenty of resilience opportunities with all electric homes. And, and Sam, I do want to back you up. Um, you, you were correct uh, on the uh, passive house example, and I think our, our Zero Energy Ready Homes program was uh, a little bit less than passive house, but uh, there were some studies done from Rocky Mountain Institute, if you want to, if the, uh, if the person that asked the question wants to Google that, where you can look at resilience of different certifica home certification programs, and uh, Zero Energy Ready Home and passive house uh, took the longest to drop down to, I believe it was 60 degrees or so. Thank you both. Uh, and looking at the clock, I think we have time for one more question. I will take it from Sarah, who says that you describe a wide range of um, version two improvements, uh, but you haven't said very much about the cost of those upgrades. Do you have uh, any further thoughts on which improvements give a good return on the upfront cost while taking into account specific uh, health, et cetera, objectives for the improvements? Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. I, um, we do a very careful analysis of the costs we're adding. We always make sure that they're highly cost effective and almost, and they always deliver a positive cash flow. In other words, if you amortize the incremental cost for the next generation spec into the mortgage and look at the incremental cost per month on your mortgage, compare that to energy savings, you know, you're always, uh, you're always in positive cash flow. So that's that's the, you know, the short answer given time's running short is that we're always in constant pursuit of positive cash flow, but we're also in a massive pursuit of improved value. You know, the big branding around Energy Star from a consumer's perspective is that these homes just live better. The branding around from a program uh, perspective is you know, that we have to get to a zero carbon future. But for the consumer, what they probably want to know is that this is a better living experience. And, uh, and that's what we're delivering with all these improvements. You know, it's time, for instance, the things, the innovations we mentioned, it, you have to start building with thermal bridging as uh, in all climate zones. It, it's just an egregious not to, and it pays big dividends. Uh, the other increase in, uh, in 2021 is the slab edge insulation, huge, huge cash flow benefit for putting slab ins insulation in climate zones three, four, and five. Better windows have a, a, have a decent payback and it keeps getting better as the cost will come down. Uh, the other improvements that we have in terms of health are not very costly and have great value in terms of addressing one of the most substantial concerns American home buyers have today. So we can go innovation by innovation and look at what we're doing and it's incredibly high value, very uh, significantly cost effective, positive cash flow. 
And that's what is the almost the branding about everything that we uh, we include in this program. We are we have to deliver the, you know, really great value, and we have to be responsive great. and move towards that zero carbon. Thank you so much, Sam and Terrence. That is the uh, end of our hour. We really appreciate your presentation and we appreciate all the questions. Uh, again, we'll be back next month uh, with uh, Cutting Edge Research. Do join us again and go to solardecathlon.gov to follow us on social media uh, in order to keep up with us on Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube. That concludes today's virtual session. Thank you very much. Have a great day.